I will now introduce your conference host, Ms. Robin Bachman, Census Bureau Chief of the National Partnership Program. You may begin. Thank you, Catherine. And welcome, everyone. We are going to do a 2020 Census Stakeholder Briefing today. Next slide, please. So I will moderate for us. I'm Robin Bachman. I'm Chief of the National Partnership Program. I'm thrilled everyone's joining us today. Um, I'll be joined by James Whitehorn, who is the Census Registering and Voting Rights Data Office Chief, Michael Haas, Senior Advisor for Data Access and Privacy, and also joining us today are Rachel Marks, Andrew Roberts, and Matt Spence from the Population Division. We look forward to taking your questions following the presentation. Um, you may also drop questions into the Q&A panel during the presentation. The questions at the end will be um, by phone. As a reminder, today's briefing is closed to the media. If you are a member of the media, please reach out to our public information office. Let's go to the next slide. And I'm going to turn it over to James. Thanks, Robin. Uh, and I appreciate the, the chance to be here and speak with you all today. Um, you know, your efforts are really one of the major things that helped make the 2020 Census a success. Uh, I'm going to confine my remarks today mostly to the redistricting data, uh, the redistricting data products, the support products that go with it, and the delivery mechanism. Next slide, please. But I always like to start with just a, a sort of a level set about the redistricting data program at the Census Bureau. Uh, it exists because of Public Law 94-171, and that law tells the Census Bureau to establish a program that allows states to identify the small area geography that they need for conducting legislative apportionment or redistricting, and then to provide the uh, results of the census to them in a timely manner. As we know, uh, we've had delays due to COVID and to our prioritization of our constitutional requirement to get the apportionment counts out, but we are getting very close, and we're excited that we're on the doorstep of of getting the redistricting data out the door to the states and, and those who need it. Uh, the redistricting data program itself focuses specifically around census blocks and voting districts, uh, but we do collect legislative and congressional districts so we can provide statistics, useful statistics for those areas uh, throughout the decade. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So we've already provided the geographic support products that come from the redistricting data program. Uh, we, we put out many, many different formats. We put out shape files, which are the geographic or the geometry files that go into a geographic information system to allow sort of the modern use of, of uh, geography and redistricting, uh, computerized mapping and redistricting. Uh, we have reference maps, we have block assignment files, name lookup tables, just a whole slew of materials to support people. I also like to point out that the reference maps, uh, we have a series of reference maps uh, for every county in the country uh, that show block level detail for uh, the, each county across the country. This is important for those uh, jurisdictions that may have to do redistricting uh, that are uh, lower levels of geography and they don't have access to the resources like a GIS. Next slide, please. In the shape files that we provide for the uh, redistricting data set, we put out a, a lot of different types of geography, administrative, legal, statistical, and the one I'm highlighting here is block. Block is an important uh, component for the purposes of redistricting. Typically, uh, most redistricting systems use uh, a system that aggregates blocks together to create the districts uh, that are being designed through the new redistricting process. Uh, but we do have a lot of other information that's also provided along with that geography. Next slide, please. And the reason why I'm highlighting blocks is I just want to make sure that uh, everyone on the call understands how the blocks fit in with the census hierarchy. Census blocks are the literal, literal building blocks of all other geographies. So you can see through this diagram uh, the way the lines connect between the different geographies. This shows you a sort of nesting relationships. So if you think uh, like the old Russian dolls, uh, census blocks nest within block groups, which nest within tracts, which nest within counties. But when you're talking about electoral geography, these don't fit nicely in that central pipeline. The blocks go into the voting districts, which nest within county, uh, but legislative districts, uh, blocks nest within those, but those only nest within state. Uh, so you can see the importance of this one specific piece of geography for the purpose of redistricting. Next slide, please. 
So now I'm going to get into the tabulation. Uh, I like to start with uh, the making the distinction between apportionment and redistricting. Uh, the apportionment numbers that we put out in April, uh, as you know, those are state level numbers. Uh, those included the resident population and the federally affiliated count overseas. Uh, those are reported together to create the apportionment count for determining the number of seats in Congress. But the resident population itself, is, which is a component of that, is valuable for people in redistricting. This is how you can calculate your ideal district size by dividing that number by the number of um, uh, seats that you're trying to create. Uh, and the resident population is what ends up in the redistricting data. So the redistricting data is the first set, as you can see by the geography line, that allows you to have that geographic granularity all the way from state down to block. It divides up that resident population into those areas, and it also provides you important characteristics. It provides race, ethnicity, uh, it provides occupancy status for housing unit counts. And this decade we have uh, a group quarters count, uh, total population by group quarters type. Uh, this will be the first census where the redistricting data is protected by differential privacy using a, a specific mechanism that we call the top-down algorithm, and you'll hear about that uh, from Michael in a few minutes. Uh, and we have split our data delivery, and this is something I'm going to go into more detail uh, just so you have a clear understanding of, of, of what these different data product formats are. Uh, the legacy format is expected to be out by August 16th of this year, and then we'll have some easier to use tools that we'll provide to our official recipients and the public uh, in September, before September 30th. Next slide, please. The content should look very familiar if you're used to looking at the 2010 data. Uh, we have the, the first five tables here, the race, Hispanic or, or not Hispanic by race, uh, and then the same for voting age, that occupancy table I talked about. And then this new table, the group quarters population by group quarters type. There are a lot of states now, I believe there's 11, uh, that actually reallocate prisoners from where census counts them based on our usual residence criteria uh, to an alternate location. Uh, so we provided this table to try to make it easier for states to be able to do that work. Next slide, please. The way this data is organized, when you get the tables or you get this data set, uh, since the, the census allows people to self-identify their race and their ethnicity, and they allow them to choose one or many uh, of those categories, we report it exactly as it's reported to us. So when people report their race, if they select a single race, they end up in the population of one race. If they select two, they end up in the population of two or more races. And this table, the race table and the race for the population 18 and over, uh, both go through this and iterate all the way down to if someone chose all six possible races. Uh, the only difference here being that the universe, the people being measured in the race table is the total population and the uh, population for the race for the population 18 years and over uh, is only the total population 18 years and over. So we take that subset before we report those numbers in that table. Next slide, please. And the reason why I'm going into so much detail here is I think it's important to understand the other table that's sort of the counterpoint to these two, which is the Hispanic or, not, or Latino and not Hispanic or Latino by race uh, tables. These are very similar in structure and how they're organized, but the uh, Hispanic or Latino is considered an ethnicity, and so if someone declares themselves as Hispanic or Latino in these tables, they automatically are only included in that Hispanic or Latino category, and then those who said they were not Hispanic or Latino are iterated by race in the same way I described in the slide before. And again, the two tables just measure from total population or the total population 18 years and over. Next slide, please. The final two tables in the redistricting data set are much simpler. Uh, we have that housing table, the occupancy status. This will report the number of housing units uh, uh, for each geography and then whether they, how many were occupied and how many were vacant. And then we'll have a group quarters population by group quarters type. And you can see the major group quarters types uh, listed there on the slide. Uh, and it'll be just a total population count. But we still felt that this would be useful uh, for those who had to do special actions prior to conducting their redistricting. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk about the data delivery. Uh, so uh, ever since we released the, the apportionment counts uh, back in April, uh, we've been working to complete our processing cycle. Uh, this kind of walks you through uh, the different steps that we have to go through, making sure people are all geocoded to the, the most detailed level of geography, 
uh, making sure the data set is complete by doing our characteristic editing and imputation, uh, applying those privacy protections that you're going to hear about in a second. Uh, and then we get to tabulate and review our redistricting data in multiple formats. As we were going through the process of uh, trying to find a way to minimize the impact of the delay to the release of this data, we recognized that one of the already planned products that we had for the 2020 census uh, would be available at this transition stage here. We still have other steps we need to do to complete our entire uh, processing and delivery cycle for the redistricting data, uh, but those are creating physical media and loading those user-friendly uh, tools and getting those out the door to the states. Uh, so we've split our data delivery, and we now have that legacy format summary file data coming out by August 16th. Uh, and then we'll have these DVDs and flash drives and our data.census.gov tools loaded before the end of September. Next slide, please. But I want to try to give you some comfort about the uh, what we're calling the legacy format summary files. Um, we typically used to call them summary files before. Uh, we added the legacy format uh, just because we needed to somehow differentiate since this would have all been released simultaneously in the past, uh, and we wanted to make sure that there was a clear distinction. They were always part of our product plan for the 2020 census. Uh, we've been providing it in this format uh, for several decades now. It does require some additional handling to be able to really pull the data out from this format. But they will be fully reviewed for, uh, for publication by the time we release them by August 16th. And as a matter of fact, they're, they're the exact same data. These are, they're, they're, they're all the PL94171 redistricting data, just different formats. So we have this legacy format in August, we have uh, these disks and our data.census.gov platform in September, but it's all going to be reflecting the same data. And as a matter of fact, the, the format that we put out, the legacy format that we put out, is actually something that we use as an input to creating those data disks that we provide to the official recipients. We've talked to uh, most of the major software vendors. We've talked to Caliper Corporation, to CityGate GIS, to ESRI, Election Data Services, Poly Data. Uh, we've talked to the, the redistricting and election staffers at the National Conference of State Legislators. We've had several conferences with the individual states. We've talked to nonprofits, the redistricting data hub, all to make sure that they understand this August format. And uh, they all have, uh, to the one that we've spoken with, have indicated that they will have the capability to work with this August format, uh, as many of them have done for several decades. Next slide, please. So just a brief physical description. I know this may be a little too much detail uh, as far as you're concerned, but I just wanted to, 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 to explain what they are because it may make people feel more comfortable with it. And that is that these are just text files. This is just a way of storing the data. Um, it's, every state gets one zip file, and every zip file will have four files in it. One's a geo header, has all the geographic information. Uh, then those first two tables, table P1 and table P2, are on what we call the first data segment. Table P3, P4, and H1 are on the second data segment. And then this decade we added a third data segment because it was needed to hold that new table, that group quarters table. So that's what people are getting. But it's every piece of every uh, data element that's been calculated for every piece of geography for table P1 is on that data segment one. And every piece of geographic information for every level of geography we've calculated is in that geo header. So that's where the additional handling comes in. Next slide, please. Uh, so we're working really hard to try to make sure that we're supporting uh, these legacy format files since they're going to be the first ones out the door. Uh, we've already pro provided the uh, technical documentation, uh, which is published online for people to familiarize themselves with. We have a prototype data set that we made from our Providence County, Rhode Island 2018 end-to-end -end census test in the 2020 format. Uh, so that's available for people to work with and practice with. Uh, we've created a header file uh, using Microsoft Excel, which has the header fields. If someone wants to start building their own database, they don't, don't have to go in and code that themselves. They can just import those uh, worksheets from that, that header file file. Uh, then we have a Microsoft Access database shell. This has table shells for all the files. It has example queries. And so people can use that to practice with the Rhode Island data. And that access shell will also work with the actual 2020 data since it all has the same structure. So you'll be able to work with that as well if you're familiar with how to use that. We have SAS scripts to help people bring uh, the data into SAS. We have R to help people bring that into uh, the, the 
uh, no license cost uh, statistical package. Uh, where we have a video that should be coming out shortly, which walks people through how to use the Microsoft Access Database Shell. So we're continuing to identify some tools to try to make this easier on data users. Next slide, please. So what can people expect in September? In September, that's when we're going to release those DVDs and flash drives. That has an integrated uh, browsing tool that allows for custom extraction of the data into easy-to-use tables that are important to GIS. It allows for easy browsing of the data and intuitive browsing of the data. And that's what we're going to send to the official recipients of the data. We're also going to load our data.census.gov data explorer platform, uh, which is the primary uh, dissemination tool for the Census Bureau. And that works just like uh, uh, any sort of shopping site that you've ever been to where you go in and say, you know, I want jeans and I want them to be blue and I want them to be this size. It's the same thing you go in and say, I want the redistricting data and I want it for this geography and I want this table. And it will pull up that data. If the data you're pulling up is too large, it will give you a message, but it will still allow you to download that so you can then view it uh, on your desktop. Next slide, please. And how will this go out? So the, by August 16th, we will post the, the legacy format summary files to the public uh, file transfer protocol site. Uh, this will be available to the states, to the public, anyone who wants to go get it. Uh, and so that will happen simultaneously for all states. Uh, then we're going to have those user-friendly files. We'll send those DVDs and flash drives to the official recipient list uh, that we're required to supply data to uh, under Public Law 94171. So that's the governor, majority, minority, legislative leaders, uh, redistricting commissions if they're established. And then we also send it to our nonpartisan liaison who worked with us throughout the geographic part of the program. And then, finally, we'll release that data on the data.census.gov. Next slide, please. Uh, we work to make the redistricting data website a sort of one-stop shop of where to find all of these things uh, when, when uh, they're posted to the web. Uh, we know that they, they can end up in different areas on the census website, whether it's geography or, or data visualizations or the actual data files themselves. So we put links to them. We, we sort of aggregate those links into the redistricting data uh, webpage, www.census.gov slash RDO for redistricting data office. And then uh, you can see I've got some arrows here just pointing to where people can find stuff. The official data products, uh, the geography already being there, is linked at the Decennial Census PL94171 Redistricting Data Summary Files page there. Uh, the Redistricting Data Program Management page is where you can find that prototype data. Uh, and then also, I just made a note here on the side, it is the Redistricting and Voting Rights Data Office uh, that you can get the voting rights data from the left-hand link on the left-hand side of the page where it says voting rights. It'll take you to the two products that also my office produces. Next slide, please. So I'll say thank you very much uh, right here. Uh, I'm going to hand this over to Michael Hall. He's our Senior Advisor for Data Access and Privacy, and he's going to walk us through uh, some, some topics of differential privacy, I believe, and disclosure avoidance. Great. Thank you, James. And uh, before I start, I do want to echo uh, uh, James's comment earlier uh, to thank all of, all of you participating today. Uh, the engagement that we've had with our partners and the feedback that we've received from you over the last several years has been absolutely critical to our ability to uh, improve and tune our disclosure avoidance system to better protect privacy for the 2020 census. Next slide, please. So the Census Bureau is absolutely committed to protecting the privacy of our respondents and the confidentiality of their data. And this commitment to data stewardship is a legal obligation for us under Title 13, Sections 8B and 9. But perhaps more importantly, it's absolutely fundamentally critical to our ability to actually collect and produce quality statistics about the nation. If our respondents didn't trust our ability to protect their privacy when we're uh, publishing uh, the results from the census, they wouldn't be comfortable in contributing that information in the first place. Uh, so protecting the privacy of our respondents and ensuring the confidentiality of their data is what allows us to produce the quality statistics about the country that, that the nation has come to depend upon. Next slide, please. The challenge we face, however, is that we publish enormous numbers of statistics from the census. And we know that every time you release any statistic or any data table or data product that's derived from a confidential data source, uh, you're going to reveal or leak a tiny amount of confidential or private information in the process. So each one of those statistics 
reveals a little bit about all of the individuals that are reflected therein. And the corollary to that is that if you release too many statistics at too high a degree of accuracy, uh, then eventually you're going to have revealed the entire underlying confidential data, and that's something we can't do. Next slide, please. So throughout its history, and for the better part of a century, uh, the Census Bureau has really been a world leader uh, in the, the research design and implementation of the various sets of statistical safeguards uh, that can be used to protect privacy in public data releases. And over the decades, as the amount of information that we're publishing uh, has increased and as privacy threats have, have increased as well, uh, we've had to uh, modify and improve and augment those statistical safeguards that we use in order to continue protecting those data. Um, our adoption of differentially private methods for the 2020 Census is really just the latest in what has been a very long history of continuous innovation uh, in this field. Next slide, please. And apologies for the sirens going by. Uh, there's a fire truck driving by my house. Um, the threat that we face is even greater today. Um, the, the proliferation of third-party data sources with very rich information about each and every one of us uh, and improvements in cloud computing infrastructure uh, and computing power and the uh, development of, of uh, strong uh, optimization algorithms that can leverage third-party data in an attempt to re-identify individuals in the data that we publish pose serious and demonstrated threats to our ability to protect the data uh, that we're going to publish. Uh, these are not abstract concerns. These are absolutely de demonstrated uh, and, and critical vulnerabilities that have to be addressed. Next slide, please. So what is disclosure avoidance? Disclosure avoidance is that set of statistical safeguards that I mentioned before. And disclosure avoidance methods, these statistical methods, seek to preclude re-identification of individuals in public data releases uh, by making it more difficult to perform those re-identifications in the first place. Uh, and those methods accomplish this by uh, one or more of the following things. They either seek to reduce precision of the data that you're releasing, uh, or they seek to remove vulnerable records from the published data, or they seek to add uncertainty into the data that is released. And commonly used methods, commonly used statistical safeguards uh, that perform these are, are techniques such as complementary suppression, uh, rounding, um, recoding extreme values at the top or bottom end of the distribution, uh, sampling like we've done for uh, public use microdata samples in the past, uh, record swapping like we used for the 2020 censuses, or other forms of injecting noise or error into the data all with an eye towards making re-identification more difficult and thus protecting the privacy of our respondents. Next slide, please. It's important to note, however, that any disclosure avoidance method, any of these statistical techniques to protect privacy uh, fundamentally impose a trade-off between the degree or strength of privacy protection uh, and the resulting accuracy or availability of the data. Uh, this is not a side effect of the process. This is actually what provides the privacy protection in the first place. Uh, so there is this fundamental trade-off between privacy and accuracy. And where you fall on that trade-off, where you fall on that spectrum, is determined by the implementation parameters of the method or methods that you select. And those can be things like your swap rates, your noise injection parameters, your cell suppression thresholds, and so on. That is how you manage this trade-off between privacy at the one extreme and accuracy at the other. Next slide, please. So for the 2020 census, we're going to be uh, adopting a new approach to how we do noise injection uh, for the census data that we publish. Now, as I mentioned, for the last several censuses, we've injected noise into our published data through a mechanism known as data swapping, where we swapped records uh, for entire households into nearby geographies. Uh, for the 2020 census, the injection of noise that we're going to be performing is going to be guided by a, a privacy accounting framework known as differential privacy. Now, differential privacy is not a disclosure avoidance method per se, the same way that, that swapping or other forms of, of uh, disclosure avoidance are. Uh, it's more aptly characterized as a privacy accounting framework. It allows you to define 
and then quantify privacy risk or the a degree of privacy protection. Uh, every individual that's reflected in any particular statistic is going to contribute towards the value of that published statistic. And every statistic that we, that we publish is going to reveal or leak a small amount of that private information. Uh, this differentially private accounting framework allows us to assess each individual's contribution to each of the statistics that we publish. Uh, and by measuring that, that leakage of information, by measuring that contribution and that privacy risk, it then allows us to limit or mitigate that risk through the injection of noise. So we can therefore limit how much information about each of our respondents may leak or be revealed in the statistics that we publish. Next slide, please. Now, when you combine differentially private kind of privacy risk accounting with a noise injection mechanism, um, differential privacy allows you to precisely control this leakage of information in your published statistics. And this approach offers a number of really advantageous advantages. It's a little redundant. Advantageous benefits over um, traditional approaches to disclosure avoidance. Uh, for starters, it's infinitely tunable. Uh, the parameter dials, the settings that you use for the noise injection implementation um, can be tuned anywhere from the one extreme of perfect privacy with zero accuracy to the other extreme of perfect accuracy with zero privacy or anywhere in between. Uh, more importantly, the privacy guarantee that this uh, accounting framework affords uh, is mathematically provable and it's future to, to protect, protect against known vulnerabilities, but then also to protect against vulnerabilities that may arise with uh, increase, increasing computing power or uh, the uh, continued expansion of third-party data. Uh, and the precise calibration of the noise that we inject through this framework uh, can provide us optimal data accuracy for any given level of privacy protection. Uh, so there's a lot of advantages to using this, this privacy risk accounting framework of differential privacy when we're looking to inject noise into the data to protect our respondents' privacy. Next slide, please. So over the past couple years, uh, we've worked quite extensively with many of our partners in the stakeholder community. Um, we have released, uh, since October of 2019, we've released five different sets of demonstration data products that have been generated by running 2010 census data through our 2020 census disclosure avoidance system. And producing these demonstration data products have allowed many of our data users to compare the differentially private results of those runs to the results that we published after the 2010 census, which were protected using that swapping mechanism that I mentioned before. And after each of these sets of demonstra demonstration data were released, we received substantial amounts of, of feedback and analyses from our stakeholders uh, that have helped us to improve and tune and, and adjust the algorithms that we're using uh, to ensure that the resulting data that we'll publish for the 2020 census will meet our data users' needs. Next slide, please. So as James mentioned, the first of the data products from the 2020 census that we'll be releasing that have been protected using this new disclosure avoidance system will be uh, the 2020 Census Public Law 94-171 redistricting data summary files. And uh, last month, on June 9th, uh, we announced uh, the final implementation parameters and settings that will be used for the implementation of this differentially private noise injection uh, to protect that redistricting data file. Uh, and if you want to learn more about what those settings are, I'm happy to take questions uh, later in the session today, or you can uh, find those parameters and settings uh, published on our website. Next slide, please. So if you want to learn more uh, about what we're doing with uh, our modernization of privacy protections, and if you want to stay informed of updates as they, as they develop, uh, I highly encourage each of you to subscribe to our uh, 2020 Census Data Products newsletter. So that's where you can get all the latest breaking information on our implementation of differential privacy for the 2020 census. Uh, if you want to sign up for that, just go to census.gov and search disclosure avoidance and you'll see a subscribe option there. Next slide, please. Uh, and if you want to learn more about what we're doing, um, you can check out our webpage. We have a, a wide array of resources 
uh, published on our disclosure avoidance modernization and our disclosure avoidance system. Uh, we've got frequently asked questions, issue briefs, uh, blog posts, uh, videos, and, and much, much more. Uh, you can, again, just go to census.gov and search disclosure avoidance, and that'll take you right there. Next slide, please. And we did just release a few weeks ago a, a great new video uh, that provides an overview of this approach to privacy protection. Um, it's called Pri Protecting Privacy in Census Bureau Statistics. Uh, if you haven't seen it, check it out. It's on our, uh, it's on our disclosure avoidance page, uh, and you can also find it on the Census uh, YouTube page as well. Next slide, please. And uh, with that, uh, I will turn things back over to Robin Bachman. Thanks, Michael. Um, we just wanted to remind folks that we have a number of upcoming webinars um, on redistricting and other Census Bureau topics. Um, we have a data.census.gov Q&A webinar next week. We have an American Community Survey webinar um, on the 29th. We also have a webinar on the 29th on emergency management and Census Bureau data. Um, we have a webinar on business formation statistics, et cetera. Um, we have some additional webinars coming on redistricting too in August. So please um, watch census.gov for updates. And as Michael said, um, you can subscribe to get updates if you go to census.gov. At the bottom, there's a subscribe button that you can click and follow, follow it to fill out um, so that you're getting all the updates on the topics that you're interested in.